Hi, my name's Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Okay, I have done some calibrations with the Alpha and the Beta. The Alpha source is the Polonium-210, and the Beta is the Strontium-90. And uh, when I did the Strontium-90, you can see that it was producing 3582.312 uh, centimeters uh, squared per minute um, and this is with the plus and minus one accuracy and essentially what it does it does the counting until the variation in the counts uh, varies no more than plus and minus one and it takes a little bit of time but not very much time in the case of the beta on the background it, uh, I've just got a plus or minus 10% because it's a much lower level at just seven counts compared to 3,582. So the idea is that if we get some coherent uh, strange radiation, some condensed uh, cold neutrinos uh, coming out, this string vortex soliton, as Alexander Shishkin uh, calls them, and it interacts with that strontium-90, yttrium-90 uh, source, then maybe the counts per second will drop because it will have forced some inverse uh, beta decay, therefore lowering the activity of the sample. And so um, the way we uh, uh, have this represented here is when you do the actual uh, measurement of the strontium-90 source, uh, which is off the frame there, I go here, you can see uh, strontium-90, it says over on the right, maybe, I've got it here, you can see it here in the log. Um, it shows the, the actual count, plus or minus the last background count, and as it's only 7, plus or minus that is 10% uh, is just 0.7, so 0.7 over 3582 is really not that significant. So what we're looking for, really, is that uh, potentially that the 3582 uh, sort of uh, measurement gets uh, uh, a little bit lower when we uh, do the um, uh, post uh, exposure and if that happens then uh, we will have shown that uh, synthesized strange radiation from electronuclear collapse can cause the remediation of other radionuclides and since uh, the majority of radionuclides that come from fission and are in accidents and nuclear bomb testing uh, so forth um, our beta isotopes, it would be really good that if this works. Okay, so uh, I'm just, just going to do this now for the Cobalt 60 source. And uh, what I do is I have this thing off on the cover, and I'm going to switch this to measurement plus background source. And uh, I'll come out, and you will see here when I drop this in, I think I, um, I'm going to drop this in now, and we'll see what this does. And you see that's quite a lot happening there. So I'm going to start the measuring now. Oh, I started and stopped. Let's start. Now, if you look at what would be represented on the screen if we had the device the other way up, uh, you can see that the accuracy is increasing as time of uh, accumulation is going forward. So it's showing... 3,300 roughly, around about that, 3,273. Three. And uh, as the time goes forward, the plus or minus inaccuracy drops. So we're down to 3% now. Of course, the Cobalt 60 is also gamma as well. So you actually have the ability to control all the functions here uh, of the Radioscan 701. So I can actually turn the beeping sound off here. So we don't have to listen to that clickiness. So after a period of time, that will count down to plus or minus one, which is the level at which I've said, okay, that's sufficient accuracy on the counts. And let's say it's now plus or minus two. If after the full count, uh, we're seeing 3,300, and then we expose this cobalt 60 to the experiment, and it reduces the output significantly, 
um, then we will have some very interesting data. So the half-life is 5.27 years. So obviously that is a lot less than the 28 point whatever years of strontium-90, yttrium-90. And in my view, what that's actually telling you is that cobalt-60, this synthetic isotope produced predominantly by either uh, cobalt-59 or iron-58 uh, absorbing neutrons in a nuclear reactor. So you have the steel in the nuclear reactor and there are neutrons flying out from the fission process. And these are interacting with iron, predominantly iron-58, and it progresses for forward to cobalt-60. This isotope being only 5.27 years is um, it's a um, has a high desire to decay all by itself, uh, which means its resistance to decay, in my view, is less when it's impinged upon by a cold neutrino condensate, for instance, than um, something like strontium ninety, yttrium ninety. So this was the those two isotopes, but predominantly cobalt sixty, were isotopes of choice for. Uh, Alexander Parkmo in his system. So you can still hear if I turn the sound back on. It's terrible noise. Now, something else about cobalt-60, it's often used to produce coloured quartz gems. So because it produces these high-energy betas for, um, and uh, the gamma rays, you expose the quartz to that and then you heat it up. Uh, and you get these various colours like rose quartz and, and green and orange and, and uh, canary yellow. And it's these same colours that we saw in the lion tube, the uh, fused quartz tube. And so that gave a good indication that beta particles and or gamma, but most likely beta in this case, or, or it's actually beta or x-rays actually that they that, that that it is that does this process with quartz not sorry not sorry gamma uh, sorry it's not gamma um and and so the beta particles it would have been um something like beta particles uh that are interacting with the fused quartz to have created those colors and that um is a good indication that that's what's going on in the lion reactor. The other thing about cobalt-60 is it's used for irradiation of fruits and vegetables. So if you've ever wondered why your fruits and vegetables uh, at the supermarket seem to last forever, um, it's because uh, they pass them under a source like this and it kills all the bugs in there. Now, from my point of view, uh, when you are uh, eating food that bacteria and yeast and and uh, fungus doesn't want to eat then it's probably not something you want to eat and I have a particular view about this that um, uh, since we know that uh, this type of uh, gamma rays particularly from cobalt 60 or any gamma rays they can produce these string vortex solitons these cold neutrino um, condensates uh, according to the Russians um, could they actually be destroying something that's inside the fruit that is good, just good for life? And maybe that's why uh, it does that. So, OK, anyway, that's just a, some aside whilst it's got to 1%. So you can see that's gone plus or minus 1%. And so um, on the uh, record here, uh, as soon as it gets to plus or minus 1%, it will add in a record and it's it stopped measuring there. And so we have our uh, record of our counts. I realized when making the last video that I had the strontium-90 source, the strontium-90, yttrium-90 source the wrong way up uh, when I did its uh, count measurement. And actually, uh, rather than uh, being uh, 3,582, it should be 14,626. So we have a much larger uh, signal there that's plus or minus one percent also and so uh, if we are going to see that change significantly um, given the fact that it's a 28.8 year half-life um, uh, you know we should have uh, some good resolution on any potential change so if I zoom in you can perhaps see that 14,000 at the top there 
17,000 actually on the detector there. So thank you very much for your time. I'll see you in the next video.